I haven't been on YouTube uh, in a long time. I haven't posted videos in years. So I was a little hesitant about recording this video. But I just wanted to show a vintage computer I got recently. Um, this is an Osborne Executive made in 1983 by the Osborne Computer Corporation. And uh, there isn't a whole lot of information about the Osborne Executive. You will find a little more about their first computer, the Osborne One. But the Osborne Executive, it seems like it's it's a little more tricky to find information about it. Um, I guess because there probably weren't very many of them sold and the company didn't last that long after they released this one. So I just wanted to make a video showing a little bit about it um, and what I found out recently uh, from research. So let me go ahead and turn it on. And this is the power switch here. I'm doing this one-handed, so hopefully I can hold the camera steady here. I'm just using my phone for right now. Let me see here. Okay, hold on one second. Okay, let's try that again. I had to uh, plug in an extension cord. It wasn't plugged in all the way. Okay, let's try that again. Here we go. There we go. And it just did a self check. And okay, we see the startup screen and it's asking for the disk with the operating system. And uh, when I got this computer, um, I bought it from someone online. When I got this computer, luckily it did have uh, some of the old original disk with it. Well, they're not original. Someone had made copies at some point, but I got some disk with it, and it did come with the uh, CPM um, master disk for the operating system. And so, because otherwise, I wouldn't be able to boot this computer up. <laughs> so I made copies, and uh, here's the disk I have. And the first one you can see, Osborne Executive Master Disk. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in, and I, like I said, I'm gonna see if I can do this one-handed. <laughs> So we just put this in the A drive, and let's see here, I'll try to zoom in on this, or move in towards the screen. There we go. Okay, so um, that's it's showing Osborne, and we've now loaded the operating system. And from what I've read, it's CPM, I really don't know much about it, but from what I read, it's kind of a predecessor to DOS. Um, so some of the commands that you would see in DOS are, um, are also in CPM, like DIR for directory, things like that. I'll give a quick example of that. So we're at the prompt, it says A, um, meaning A drive, and if we just type D, I R. Let's show us the directory, and it shows the drive, the files that are on the disk in the A drive. So there we go. There. Uh, one difference, apparently, with a Osborne Executive uh, versus the original Osborne One is it does have some improvements. The screen's a little uh, bigger. Still. A little bit small, hard to read, but it is at least a little bigger. And I guess the case was made stronger and um, some improvements to memory and different things like that. Um, it's it's a pretty interesting computer. Uh, they Osborne called it a portable. Um, it's more like luggable because this thing is pretty heavy. <laughs> it's and when it closes up, it's about the size of a big suitcase. So I don't know if you'd want to carry this thing around all day. <laughs> um, I could. See, I guess, bringing it, you know, to work, to your office, and, and back home if you worked at home. Um, and I don't know why, it just, oh, I know why, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I got a, uh, the extension cord where it plugs into the outlet's a little loose, so. Um, but, okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show basic, and I'm going to show a couple little things that I had to find out kind of the hard way. Like I said, it's hard to find information about this computer. So I'm going to load up basic and then um, show a couple things with that. Okay, I found out what's happening. Um, this front panel is 
it's kind of loose. I thought I had fixed it, but it, apparently it's still having problems. Basically, um, since this front panel is loose, it's causing the main motherboard inside to move, and that causes the power to come off sometimes. I, I don't know. I, I thought I had fixed it, but obviously I'm going to have to still take another look at it. But we'll try to do this. Um, okay, so I have... I have the operating system, the master disk here, and let's go ahead and put that in. Um, I want to show you how you would get to basic because the thing with this computer is it does not have basic built in with a ROM like other vintage computers of the time period did. Uh, other computers of the early 1980s had basic already built in with a ROM chip. So as soon as you started the computer, you were in basic and you could just start programming. This computer does not have that. You have to start it up with the operating system and then you have to load basic from a disk. And I do have it here, a copy of it. Um, and the one I'm going to use, the version of basic here is called mBasic. Um, it's pretty similar to other versions of basic that you would use on, on other vintage computers of the time period like the Apple II or Commodore VIC-20 or Commodore 64, but there's some differences, which I'll explain, because one of them it seems pretty obvious, but I really had to look it up, is just how to clear the screen. Um, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute here. So let's go ahead and load the operating system first, again. <laughs> Hopefully we can uh, do this without the computer shutting off again. I really need to fix that. <laughs> okay, so it's loading the operating system. There we go. Okay, so we have it booted up now, and we'll take out the uh, master disk. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put in the disk that has basic right here. I'll put that into the A drive. And I have another disk here that I saved um, some basic programs that I made earlier. I'm going to put that in the B drive so I'll be able to uh, load them to show. Okay, this is a little tricky doing this one-handed, but there we go. I'll have to just uh, bear with me here. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start basic. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to type, uh, at the A prompt, I'm going to type mBasic. If the phone will focus, which I'm sorry if you can't see that clearly, my phone just does not, it's having a hard time with the uh, screen here, but okay. So I'm going to type in mBasic, and now it's starting up basic. Okay, so um, if anyone has used, uh, you know, early versions of basic on vintage computers before you know basically how it works every line has a number so you know we can go um, let me try to get in closer so I just typed in 10 print hello and then, of course, if we type in run, then it'll execute the code. And so, the computer prints hello on the screen, or displays hello. Now here's something that seems really simple, that you would think would be really easy, to just clear the screen. Um, other computers would have, you know, you would just put in uh, CLS or home, and it would clear the screen and put the cursor up in the corner, upper left corner. This computer, it doesn't have anything like that. And from what I was told, it's because CPM basically just treats the computer kind of like it's a dumb terminal. It doesn't, it doesn't really have any built-in functions for this for the screen. So you have to do things kind of in a little bit of a weird way. So the way you would clear the screen on this computer is you would have to type kind of a, a weird thing. You have to use control characters. So if you go print chr dollar sign and then in parentheses put in 26. 
And it looks like I, hold on, I made a mistake here because like I said, this is a little, okay, I-N-T, C-H-R, dollar sign, and then in parentheses, 26. So you're printing a uh, control character 26, basically, and it clears the screen. Um, I had to do a lot of digging just to find that. I, yeah, I couldn't find any, any easier way to do that. So that was one thing, you know, hopefully that'll be helpful if other people are, are playing around with an old Osborne computer and are trying to find that. Well, there you go. That's how you do it. So, um, I'm going to show, um, one of the, a simple little timer program I made. It just shows elapsed minutes and seconds. And, um, I'm going to show you how to do that. Now, there's two ways that I found that you can um, load in a program that you've written before. You can either do it from within BASIC by just type entering in a load. So if we go load and then um, my disk with the programs I made are again on the B drive. So I'm going to tell it B colon and then timer dot bass for basic file and that's going to tell it to load this program from the B drive and there we go it says OK so if we tell it to run And this is a little program I made. We've got some menu options there. We can start the timer, stop it, reset it, or of course, forward it, exit. Um, let's go ahead and start it. And it just counts the seconds. Um, I made this because this computer does not, as far as I know, does not have any kind of a real-time clock built in. So I thought it would be kind of neat just to make this little timer. Yeah, I really apologize if it's not very clear. Um, I haven't had a decent video camera in years, so I'm just using my phone for now. But, yeah. So, um, if we let it count, you know, it'll show the elapsed seconds, and then it'll count the minutes, and that's basically what it does. Nothing really fancy, just kind of an, a little timer I thought might be useful for something. Also, I... I did that just to get a better idea of how to handle loops on this computer so that maybe later on I can make uh, make games or something. So, yeah, that's that's one way you would load in a program. So let's uh, stop it and then we'll exit. And I made it so it clears a screen uh, when, you, when you exit the program. So now I'm going to show you the other way. Um, we're going to go back to CPM. And to do that, we type in system. And I guess, you know, that means going back to the operating system. And it just gives us the A prompt. So now we're back at CPM. We do not have basic in the memory anymore. So if we try to give it basic commands, it won't know what, what to do. It'll, it'll just give you an error message. But what we are going to do is we're going to reload basic. But this is kind of a simple little trick for how you can load your basic program and end basic in at the same time you just when you're at the a prompt just type in m basic then space and then the file name for the program you want to load so i'm going to go b colon timer dot bass for the uh you know, the timer program I made. And then we... So now it's going to load um, in basic and then automatically loads the other uh, the program from the other drive. And then boom, we're right in to the program. So you don't have to, you know, go through two steps. Load up basic and then, you know, then from there tell it to load the file. You can just do it in one step. And um, I kind of found that out by accident. Maybe other people who have more experience would already know that, but I could figure it out by accident by just playing around. And I was like, oh, wow, 
You can do that in one step. Okay. Makes things a little bit easier. So, um, yeah, it's uh, that's just a couple little helpful things um, I found if anyone is playing around with these uh, old Osborne computers. They're interesting. They're definitely interesting. Um, they're not, they don't seem to be quite as programmer friendly as other vintage computers, I guess, because uh, this computer was mainly intended for business use, I guess, you know, for, um, for people doing, using productivity software like word processing, spreadsheets. It was, it was mainly made for business purposes, but you can program them. You can program them. Um, and, you know, they're pretty cool. It's just that there's a few things it seems that mm, it's kind of a learning curve. You know, like, even if you are used to using vintage computers, when you use this one, some things are a little different, a little weird on it, you know. Um, like, on most com other computers, when you want to read something from the keyboard using peak statements, where you just read directly from the memory to see whether a key was pressed or whether any key is pressed down, the way this computer is made, it's, it's hard to do that. Um, I ended up having to use a, a function called in key, um, and there's no easy way to read directly from the keyboard or directly from the memory to see if a key has been pressed. It's kind of, it's kind of tricky. Um, also positioning the cursor at a certain, you know, X and, and Y position, um, with other computers like the Apple II, you would just use H tab and V tab. With this, it doesn't really have any built-in functions like that. Again, you have to use some kind of weird um, control character things. It's like a long, a long statement just to position the cursor at a certain place on the screen. So you know, it's it's a little it's a little tricky, but still, it's a pretty you know it's a pretty cool computer, and it definitely um, it's historically significant because. Uh, the Osborne Computer Corporation is pretty well believed to be have released the first, you know, portable computer. And this was their second computer. This was only their second computer, and they didn't last very long after this. So, as far as I can tell, this computer is pretty rare. Um, you know, so it is historically significant, and it's kind of interesting to play around with. Um, okay, I guess that's about it for now. I may make some more videos showing this computer or some other vintage computers. I don't know. Like I said, I'm uh, not really too active on YouTube anymore. Um, I haven't been in years. But I just hope some people will find this interesting. And um, yeah, thanks for watching.